This is lecture 12 called Conversion. It's our third lecture on the doctrine of what? Soteriology. Very good. Our third lecture on the doctrine of soteriology. And this is talking about how somebody becomes a Christian, how somebody gets saved, how somebody experiences regeneration. And what I've done here in this table is look through the whole book of Acts at all of the different conversion stories there and categorize them based on which elements are present. And what you can see here by looking at this is, for example, Acts 2.38 is the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, we, we hear Peter saying the words, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He never said believe, did he? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, he never said believe, but he said repent, he said be baptized, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Acts chapter 3.19, he just says repent. He doesn't say believe get baptized or receive the Spirit. Acts 8, 12, when they believed Philip preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, both men and women. So they believed and they were baptized. And then a few verses later, verse 17, the apostles come and they lay hands on them to receive the Spirit. Um, and so these are the four elements that we see. A lot of times uh, people will just focus on one or leave out one or something like that. But uh, I just wanted to be thorough here and show you that, you know, obviously belief is really big. You know, you have a lot on belief. And then the other one that is, is, is bigger than you might have expected is baptism. Baptism is huge in the book of Acts. Um, and baptism and repentance really are two sides of the same coin. You know, baptism was the physical act people went through to show repentance. You know, so uh, they're not really all that different. But receiving the Spirit um, is different, and that's uh, where oftentimes people lay hands on them, the new converts, and then they um, receive the Spirit. Oh, What's that? You, no, you don't have to write the whole thing down if you don't want to, but you definitely do need to know the four elements of conversion. Belief, repentance, baptism, and spirit. Um, receiving the spirit. Trying to see what else I want to do with this. Did you say, um, what about the spirit? Like Receive the spirit. The spirit is often portrayed as a liquid that is poured out, that fills or in which you are dunked, immersed, baptized. The spirit is not a liquid. It's portrayed as a liquid, okay? <laughs> That's the, does that make sense? All right, so first up, we have uh, believe the gospel, right? Believe. And it's really believe the gospel. And then uh, second and third is repent and be baptized. And then fourth, we have receive the Spirit. Okay, four, four elements. I kind of squished two and three together, like I said before, because of how, um, as far as meaning goes, what does baptism mean? It means you're making a decision to repent. So they're not really two separate, but um, I just kind of separated them out anyhow. All right, so first up, the question is about the gospel is what is the gospel? What is the gospel? And, uh, 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 or put it put another way, what, what does the gospel do? So we're going to look at 2 Timothy 1.10 on that and see what it says here. Kind of like the middle of a sentence. All right, who who are we at here? Jacob, Sydney. 
but you removed your seat. Okay, well, you can go back there. All right, Jacob? All right. She's totally mad. Well, no, let's, let's let her go. She wants to go. No, no, I really don't. All right, Jacob. <laughs> Verses 8 through 10. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now <coughs> has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to life. All right, what I really want to focus on there is this part right here. Christ abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So what does the gospel do? If you, if you believe the gospel, it results in life and immortality. How does one get immortality? Resurrection. Right? So if you believe in that gospel, according to this scripture right here, the result is immortal life, immortality through the gospel. Right? And so the gospel is not a minor question. Like it's the gospel is a message resulting in eternal life. It's a message you believe. If you believe the gospel, it's the, if, if you believe the gospel message, it results in eternal life. All right? That's assuming nothing goes wrong in between. <laughs> I don't know if I deal with that. Do I deal with that in this class? Perseverance? Yeah. Okay. So, the gospel is not a genre of music. It's not a biography of Jesus. And it's not just some random good news that you hear. It's not a general communication about the Bible. The gospel is a specific message that people preached from town to town that if you believed in it, resulted in eternal life or results ultimately in eternal life. We know that um, as part of the package, you experience all those things we talked about last time. You experience um, having your sin wiped away freed from sin so you can live righteously. All those other things, too, is part of it. But ultimately, it results in eternal life. All right, so one of the things that comes up a lot is this misunderstanding about the word word. Have any of you done any business with this yet? People think the, they don't understand what the word word means. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? It's okay if you don't. Okay, good. It's more fun if you don't, actually, because if you do, then it's like, well, what do I, what, what are they paying me for, you know? Um, what is the Word of God? <laughs> Why are you asking Kyle? It's an inside joke from the Oh. Okay, so I want to give you a, a Bible dictionary definition on the Word of God that I made up myself, okay? And uh, so in the Old Testament, OT, right, we find that the Word of God is God's activity in the world. And there are examples of that in Psalm 36, but also lots of other places too. The other classic one is Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. Um, it's also God's message spoken by the prophet. And uh, basically you can look at the first chapter of any prophet to see that. But another scripture uh, would be 1 Kings 21, 28 to 29. Um, and thirdly, it's a synonym for law as in Psalm 119, 16 to 17. In the New Testament, the phrase, you know, the word word or the phrase word of God um, is God's command 
commandment, God's commandment, you know, basically a, a synonym for the law. Of, um, and that I have as an example in Mark 7.13. Or, most often, it refers to the gospel message. And that's, I have a million verses on that, but Matthew 13, 19 um, to 23. We'll definitely take a look at that in just a minute here. Uh, but also Acts 8, 4, 5, 12, 14, 25. And uh, lots of other places. I'll just give them to you. We'll give you a little bonus here. No extra charge. First Peter... 123, okay. And then um, it also means God's activity to search people's hearts. And that's Hebrews 4, 11 to 13. All right, so this is a range of definitions for the idea of the Word of God. Um, in the Old Testament, we read things about, we read, statements about how God's Word does things. For example, Psalm 33, 6 reads, By the Word of the Lord the heavens were made. Right? How does that make sense? Well, in Genesis, God says, Let there be light. Let there be this. Let there be that. Right? God's Word generates activity in the world. That's how God interacts with the world, is through His Word. Um, another example is, He sent His Word and healed them and deliver them from their destructions. That's Isaiah 55. I have a quote for you from James Dunn. He says, The three, spirit, wisdom, and word, are simply alternative ways of speaking about the effective power of God in His active relationship with His world and its inhabitants. So in other words, frequently in the Old Testament, when it says the word of the Lord or God's word, it's talking about how God is interacting with creation. All right. Then specifically, you get this second one here where the Word of God is God's message spoken by the prophet. And it says in 1 Kings 21, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen Ahab? And so on. Right? And so you see that with all the prophets. Right? The word of the Lord came to so-and-so. The word of the Lord came to Isaiah. The word of the Lord came to Joel. And so on. Right? So the Word of God in the Old Testament is not only God just interacting in His creation, but more specifically, frequently, the, the, the idea is that God has a message for the prophet to give to the people. And then also, especially in Psalm 119, the Word is synonymous with the law. Listen to this. This is Psalm 119, 16 to 17. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Uh, two statements saying the same things with different words. Or, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. The idea is the word is God's law or commandments. Very similar to what we see in Mark 7.13 when Jesus says, you make void the word of God by your tradition. There, the Word of God is God's commandment to do a certain thing that they're making void by their tradition. Um, but really, what I want to focus on on this lecture on conversion is, uh, under number one here, is believe. What do we believe? The Gospel. And most frequently, within the New Testament, the, the, the Word, the phrase Word, or the phrase Word of God, or just the word Word, refers to the gospel message. That is the message that people speak so that if people believe it, they re it results in salvation. Okay? So I want to look at these scriptures with you at this time. And uh, let's see here. Pull up the Bible, Christian Bible, uh, 1319. All right, Mallory. Be able to see it from there? And 20, uh, 19 and 23. 19 and 23? 19 through okay, 23. Right. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. 
The seed sown on rocky ground is the person who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But he has no root in himself and does not endure when trouble or persecution corners because of the word. Immediately he falls away. The seed sown among thorns is the person who hears the word, but worldly cares and the seductiveness of wealth choke the word, so it produces nothing. But as for the seed sown on good soil, this is the person who bears the word and understands. He bears fruit, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. All right. So you see I have marked up on here what we're talking about. When Jesus tells the parable of the sower and the seed, he's talking about a farmer throwing seeds. But what the truth that parable communicates is how people hear the message that he preaches. Okay? And so what is the message? When anyone hears the word of the kingdom. All right? So the word word here is not just like they went out and said kingdom, 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 kingdom. Kingdom, kingdom. It's not just saying one word over and over again, right? It's a message about the kingdom. I'll give you the message about the kingdom. Are you ready? God plans to set the world right. That wasn't complicated, was it? God plans to heal the world. One day Jesus will return and establish justice on earth. The animals will get along. The people will get along. Death will be done away with. Suffering will come to an end. That's the message about the kingdom, right? And then usually there's a call to repentance. And the wicked are judged, so you better repent, right? That's, that's the message about the kingdom in a nutshell that Jesus preached that we see throughout the Old Testament. However, later on when he refers back to it, he just says the word. He doesn't say the message about the kingdom, the message about the kingdom. He just says the word, the word, the word. So frequently the word uh, in the Bible... So anyhow... I wanted to play off of what uh, Sidney said earlier. Um, most people think the phrase Word of God is a way of talking about the Bible as a whole. That's a misunderstanding. I mean, I know people do that today, but the Bible doesn't do that itself. The Bible never talks about itself as a whole as being the Word of God. What is the, what, how does the Bible refer to itself? It doesn't use the term Bible either. Yes, yeah, scriptures. Right. They will say something like, has it not been written? So like the phrase written or it, the scripture says, right? So when the Bible refers to itself, it uses scriptures or writings or it'll say the law and the prophets, right? Or it'll just say the prophet says, something like that. Um, so I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't want you to be confused by the common way that people think of the Word of God as being the whole Bible versus how the Bible actually uses the phrase the Word of God. And what I'm saying is that when you're in the New Testament, the majority, the vast majority of the time, when it uses the, uh, when it's talking about the Word, it's actually talking about the gospel message that we're called to preach. I want to show you one other example of this in Acts. What did I say for Acts? Eight something? Eight four? All right. All right. All right. Let's take a look. Uh, Kyle. Eight four? Yeah. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. The word. Keep going. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and pro proclaimed to them the Christ. Hold on a second. I thought they went preaching the word. What's he doing preaching Christ? It's the same thing, right? That's what people do when they write. They don't say, now those who were scattered about went preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the word. And the crowds, they believed in the word. You know, you're not going to just say the word word a million times, right? You're going to say word, then you're going to say Christ, then you're going to say gospel, right? But you have to, as a reader, pick up on those interchanges that preaching the word is the same thing as proclaiming the Christ, the Messiah, right? And that is the same as verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. What's Philip preaching here? Yeah, the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, right? And so this is actually the word for gospel. I don't know why the ESV dropped the ball and changed it to good news there. Oh, it's so frustrating when they do that. 
Man, it's ubiquitous. Simmer down, simmer down. It's not the end of the world. Man, they all do it. It's so dirty. Oh, they all say good news, don't they? Huh. All right, I'm going to show you what it actually says. Okay, it says when, but, or when, but when, uh, they believed Philip preaching the gospel concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women. All right, so this right here, this word, I know it's a different language, all right, just bear with me. It says evangelizomene, evangelizomene, ah, can't even say it, evangelizomene. There it is. Um, and in English letters, it looks like this. That's not English. E. Man. Okay, it's like a U. It's really hard to do this. Okay, that's actually what it says right there. Right? It's E U A G G. In Greek, when you have G G like that, you make it ng. And in Greek, when you have u like this, you make it into a v. So we actually say it like this. And that's, that's like a weird form of the word. The actual root word is vangelizo, OK? However, this is my point to you. This right here, this prefix, means good. And Angelo is the word for, or angelos is the word for messenger, but it's a good message, right? And that's where they get good news from. But here's the dirty thing that I was just uh, feeling a little uh, frustrated by, is that anytime they talk about the uh, good news or gospel message, and, it re and, and they're talking about the cross, they use the word gospel. And when they talk about the kingdom, they use the word good news to somehow train your mind to think, oh, that's, that's nice, that kingdom stuff. But the gospel is about the cross. And I think that's just so dirty because really it's the same, it's the same language used in all these different cases. Um, if you didn't get that, don't worry. It's not on the quiz. I just felt a need. It's the same words, though? Same exact words. So like um, if, we, if we look for a verse where it has gospel and cross in it, Look, it's exactly the same word. Evangelizeste, right? And yet here, they're going to translate it, preach the gospel. Why is it gospel when it's referring to cross, but yet it's good news when it refers to kingdom? Ladies and gentlemen, the gospel is about the kingdom and the cross. Why do we have to, like, separate, oh, that's, just, that's nice, that's good news, but this is gospel. You have to believe this. No, you have to believe all of it, right? And so what I'm getting at, and what you'll see in a minute, is that there are really three ingredients to the gospel message. Kingdom, cross, and resurrection. The first is that God plans to heal the world to establish his just rule on this planet. The second is that Jesus died so that he could deal with our sins. And the third is that God raised him from the dead, proving that he is the king. He is the Messiah. Right? And these things are all interrelated, and you can say them a whole bunch of different ways. If you want to be really brief about it, you say Christ crucified, you know, because that en engages both the, the Christ aspect is obviously about kingdom, because Christ means king of the kingdom, and crucified has the uh, cross there. I mean, I guess you'd have to also make clear resurrection as well. But um, these are the three elements of the gospel. If you give somebody a message all about how God raised Jesus from the dead, but you never tell them, why, or that he died for your sins, you haven't told them the whole gospel. You know what I'm saying? You need to tell somebody the whole message of all three of these things in order to get the whole gospel in there. Uh, all right, so anyhow, I just complained about the translation, but back to Acts 8.12. In the first case, in verse 4, I want you to write down um, the word. Next to verse 5, I want you to write down Christ. Next to verse 12, I want you to write down the gospel 
about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So that's kind of long. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? You already did that? All right, so like you have in your notes, right? You have, you have Acts 8, 4, 5, 12, then there's going to be a couple more. Here it, here it called it the Word. Here it called it Christ. Here it called the gospel about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. See how it says it right there? The, the good news or gospel about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. These are all synonymous ways of talking about the same thing. These are all synonyms or interchangeable expressions. And then there's verse 14. Look at this. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received what? The Word of God. Word of God right? What verse is that? 14? So here we have the Word of God. And then what was that last one? 25. Word of the Lord, right? They solemnly testify to the word of the Lord. What I did is when I saw these, I circled them in my Bible. You know what I mean? And just draw lines between them because it clarifies for you different ways of talking about the same thing. Everybody on board? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, if you preach the word, if you preach Christ, if you preach the gospel about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, if you preach the word of God or if you preach the word of the Lord, it's all, it's all talking about the same thing. And uh, if, you, if, if you don't get that they're all talking about the same thing, you're going to be like, oh, well, you know, I was out preaching the word of the Lord and you know, he's over there preaching Christ. They're totally different things. No, it's supposed to be the same thing. We're all supposed to be on the same team here with the same book. Right? Um, so let's, l let me just show you one last verse to round out this little word business, um, which is uh, 1 Peter 1 23. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. There we have it, right? Take a look at it again. You have been what? Born again, right? You've been born again through this seed, right? What's the seed? The living and enduring Word of God. Then he quotes the Old Testament. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the Word which was preached to you. You see how that works? So... Word of God, Word of the Lord, or just the Word is the message preached. Does that make sense? I'm kind of beating a dead horse here. This is a different version of the same thing. It says, but the Word of the Lord remains forever, and this, is, and this Word is the good news that was preached to you. Okay, so 1 Peter 1.23 makes the point that this Word is the same thing that people preach. The reason why this is significant is because when you start reading the scriptures and you start seeing the phrase, the word, they preach the word and stuff like that, I don't want you to think it's some random, th random sermon about, you know, the prophets of Baal and Elijah or something. Like, it's not just a general teaching about the Bible. It's a narrow, laser-focused message on one or more of these three things. This is the gospel message. It's not just like a, a lecture on, you know, how, how great Solomon was or something. You know, I mean, I'm sure that's cool, but like that's not what gospel, that's not gospel, okay? So uh, that's just a terminology issue. Um, let's, let's move on to talk about the three elements of the gospel. Uh, the way I want to do that is look at Matthew 16, 21 with you. So this is going to be next to kingdom. What does that say? Uh, whose turn is it? Jared, your turn. Uh, Matthew 16, is it your turn, Kyle? Uh, 
Jared, could you read Matthew yeah. 16, 21? Uh, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. How do they reply? How do they respond to that? Were they, were they like, oh, well, that makes sense, Jesus, because you're the Savior of the world, and of course you have to die for our sins. No. How did they respond when Jesus said that? They didn't believe him, did they? No. Look what it says. Peter took him aside and said, far be it from you, Lord. Right? So, look. Jesus, this is chapter 16 of Matthew. You have 16 chapters before this. And that whole time, Jesus is out preaching, right? And he doesn't begin to show his disciples that he has to suffer and be killed and be raised on the third day until chapter 16. And when he tells them, they're just like, Jesus, what in the world are you talking about? This doesn't make any sense. And Peter goes and rebukes him. Could you imagine taking Jesus aside and being like, Jesus, come over here. You can't talk like that in front of the other disciples. They're going to think you're crazy. Right? Or whatever Peter said to him, right? That's how he received the cross. He didn't receive the cross, in other words, or the resurrection. So what was Jesus, I mean, eventually, once it happened, Peter got on board. We know that, right? But what was Jesus preaching in the whole first 16 chapters of Matthew if he wasn't preaching about the cross? Because as soon as he mentioned the cross, they all freaked out on him. Well, we don't have to guess because it says right here, well, that's, that's John. It says right here, from that time, this is Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven. That was his message. It was a message of repentance based on the coming kingdom. Or, verse 23, He went through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. All right. So what was Jesus out there preaching? He was preaching the kingdom preaching the kingdom for chapter after chapter after chapter. And finally, when he got to talk, talking about the cross, he only mentioned it in private to his own disciples, and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up to Jerusalem. They're going to kill me. I'm going to suffer. They're going to kill me. After three days, I'm going to rise from the dead. And they were just like, Jesus, what in the world are you talking about? And then it happened, and then they came to understand it, and they added it in. So the first part of the gospel that Jesus preached that he sent out the 12 to preach, that he sent out the 70 to preach, is the part of the gospel that most people don't preach today at all because they have this heaven mythology or, or some other thing going on or they think Jesus came to make you rich. You know, the, the message is about how God is going to fix this world and how he's going to judge this world. And that's the kingdom of God. It includes judgment and restoration. And then the cross, that Jesus died so that you could be a part of that kingdom, right? and that God raised him from, from the dead, proving that he is the Messiah. So those are the three elements of the gospel message. I'll, I'll show you some more verses on that in just a second here. In our day and time, it's very common in a gospel presentation to hear about the cross and then nothing else. Did you know that? I think you knew that. You took my evangelism class. I hope you know that. Of course, that was just a, a whirlwind of a week, and you might have forgotten all of it by now. But hopefully you took good notes. Um, so if you look at evangelistic tracts, you know what a tract is? It's like a little brochure that tells you how to get saved. You know, have you seen one of these before uh, in the, the heartland? Everyone's already Christian there, so you don't need these things. Well, up, up in the frozen north, east, we have, not, we have these people called non-Christians. And um, so one of the ways people try to reach out to them is they, they print out these little brochures. They hand them to them and say, hey, read this. And on the brochure, it tells you the message you need to believe in order to get saved. And part of that message is that Jesus died for your sins. The problem is they never, which is great, and I, I'm on board with that, but they never also talk about the kingdom and they never talk about resurrection. And then they throw in some other stuff that's not actually in the book. So um, I just want to make you aware that the cross does tend to get overemphasized, but these are the three elements. Let me, let me prove to you, I think I proved to you that the kingdom is a gospel element because we see Jesus preaching it 
proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom throughout uh, Galilee. You see the same thing in chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. Um, Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So the gospel of the kingdom doesn't go away. It persists until all the nations get a chance to hear it, and then the end will come. Okay, that's according to Jesus, Matthew 24, 14. As far as the cross goes, we see, it, we see the Apostle Paul mention this in um, Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1, 23. I have it right here for you. He says, we preach Christ crucified. Or in verse uh, 17, he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of his power. For the word of the cross, there's the word again. See it? The word? The word of the cross. What is the word? The word is the message or the gospel of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the cross is a significant part of the gospel message. And then last of all is the resurrection. And I can show you that throughout the book of Acts here. Acts 1.22. Whose turn to read that one? All right. So they were witnesses in the book of Acts, right? What were they witnesses of? Whose resurrection? Right. How are you a witness of the resurrection? What qualifies you? What? You saw him after he had been raised from the dead. Those are the only people that qualify as eyewitnesses, people that saw it with their own eye, who witnessed it with their eye, right? So... Um, Acts 2.32 says, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. 3.15, And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. 4.33, And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord, Jesus. And so what we see throughout the book of Acts, throughout all this preaching that happens in Acts, is they're always testifying to the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead, which proves, once again, it proves that He is the Messiah. That's why it's so significant. Resurrection means that He is Christ or Messiah. So those are, those are three elements of belief when it comes to conversion and this whole subject of soteriology. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is repentance and baptism. One of the things I discovered reading the prophets, anybody ever read the prophets like Isaiah or any of these guys? You ever read that stuff? Anybody? What's that? Not yet. Not yet. You read the prophets, what you discover is they will talk about the kingdom, but usually uh, right before they talk about the kingdom, they'll talk about the judgment of God. And the phrase they'll use frequently is the day of the Lord. All right? And so... I, Isaiah, for example, Isaiah 25 is one of the most sublime, inspiring messages that describes to us how God is going to swallow up death and he's going to have a big party and everyone's going to be there and it's going to be this awesome celebration with steak and wine and how people are going to be cheering and crying out and they're going to, they're going to say things like, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is Yahweh. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. But right before Isaiah 25 and this whole big dinner party, we get Isaiah 24, which is the most wrathful chapter in the whole Old Testament. Right? Where it talks about how the earth is going to be utterly empty and utterly plundered. For the Lord has spoken, the earth mourns and withers, the world languishes and withers, the highest people of the earth languish, the earth lies defiled under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed the laws. And it goes on and it talks about how God is going to punish the earth. And this is the standard pattern we see throughout the prophets, that they proclaim the kingdom, but it's not just Disney World, right? It's first 
judgment, and secondly, restoration. And these are the two prongs of the kingdom message. And so when Jesus goes to preach the kingdom, the very first word he says is repent. Right? Did you see that before in Matthew 4, 17? He doesn't even say kingdom. He's like, repent, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why does the kingdom inspire repentance? Because it's the end of it all. It's the time when you face God, when you face your maker, and when you either face judgment or you enjoy the restoration of the age to come. One or the other, okay? And so, just like the, 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 the message, you know, we, we call it gospel. We also call it good news. We also call it the word, right? And we call it some other things here too, right? Um, just as it's good news to those who believe it, to those who disbelieve it, to those who reject God, it's bad news, the coming kingdom, Right? Because the kingdom is the judgment and it's the, it's the wrath of God and you're not saved from the wrath of God unless the blood of Christ covers you. Remember we read that in Romans? Probably not. It was a little while ago. But in Romans it says that we are saved from the wrath of God, the wrath to come through His blood. So the kingdom message is not just good news. It's also something that inspires repentance. Okay, especially this part right here. So it inspires repentance, which is why Jesus goes around. Here's another scripture that Jesus, that describes Jesus preaching. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, Mark 1, 14, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Right? So the, 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 there's something about the kingdom that calls us to repentance. What is repentance? It's realizing that we are sorry for what, how we've been living and that we want to change. Simple as that. It's, the, the, the technical definition is that you change your mind, right? But it's, it's, it's not change your mind like, I used to like vanilla ice cream, now I like chocolate. It's not something like that. It's more like change your, your, you know, your heart about how you've been living, get right with God. You know, that's what repentance is. And so that's what we see uh, in, in conversions throughout the book of Acts. Look at uh, Mark 3.14. I'll have it up here for you. When Jesus sent out the twelve, he says, um, He appointed the twelve whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him, and they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. Right? So he, he gets the twelve. Remember, Jesus gathered the twelve, and he sent them out to preach. Right? What, what did they preach? What was their message? So they went out and preached. This is chapter 6, verse 12, talking about the same group of the 12. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. That's a necessary part of conversion. Look, if you just believe but you don't repent, it's not going to cut it. Right? You have to believe and repent. And part of that repentance also is baptism, is that moment when you make a public declaration and say, I turn away from sins. I want to die with Christ. I want a new life. I want to be born again. And that's all wrapped up in that you know, physical ceremony that has to synchronize with your internal heart. Look, if you get baptized and you're not repenting, it's no better than taking a bath. Right? And if you um, repent, then you would want to do it in the biblical way, which is, typically that somebody would be baptized, right? That's what we see over and over in the book of Acts. That's what we see in the, the ministry of Jesus. Um, how should I ex explain this to you? Acts, Acts um, 8, 12 says that when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Um, and we know that that wasn't baptism in the Spirit because they didn't receive the Spirit. And that's why the apostles came later in verse 15 here, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Spirit. So the Spirit was not there yet, for they had not, He had not fallen on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So receiving the Spirit and getting baptized are two separate things, right? Be, being baptized goes with repentance. Receiving the Spirit 
goes with empowering you to live a holy life. Two totally separate things. But I think repentance and baptism are very close to each other. Any comments on this? On belief, repentance, baptism? Are we cool? You still alive? One more day? All right, Acts 10.38. This is, uh, what's his face? Peter at Cornelius' house. I don't remember who, it's Brooks' turn, isn't it? It's my turn. Yay, it's so nice to finally get you to have a chance. <laughs> Go, ahead. Go ahead. Don't hold us in suspense. 37? Yeah, mm -hmm. this is Acts 10.37. I'll let you know when to stop. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, from the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to, oh, sorry. Not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judged of the living and the dead. Mm. All right, that's good. One more, one more. <laughs> to them all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Oh, man, I just, I just love this summary that Peter gives. It's so tight, it's so succinct, and it's so thorough. What he says is, you know Jesus of Nazareth, right? That he's this person that God empowered, um, God anointed him, he went about healing people, and you know what? We're witnesses. We were there with him. We saw him heal people. We saw him preach, right? And that um, they put him to death, but God raised him from the dead, and we ate and drank with him. Hello? We ate and drank with him after he had been killed, because God raised him from the dead. We had lunch together, right? And what did Jesus command them to preach and to testify? That he is the Savior of the world? I mean, that's true. He is the Savior of the world. But what did he tell him to preach? <coughs> that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. And everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. You see, they work together. They work together. You have that judgment. It inspires repentance. And then what comes in? The waves and flood of forgiveness on the person. But if you, want, if you want to come into the faith, if you want to come into conversion, if you want to become a Christian, if you want to get saved and you don't want to repent, it's not going to work, right? And if you have that repentance where you say, look, I'm tired of being Lord, I want Jesus to be Lord, then you do have this experience and you do have this forgiveness which comes in. And that's part of the gospel message. It's a part that we don't hear much today but it's still a part that we see very clearly in the Bible. And last of all, people receive the gift of the Spirit. And so, I, I like uh, chapter 19. Acts 19 is good on this one. 19, verse 9 to, uh, no, verse 1, excuse me. Verse 1 through 7. Who's, whose turn we got here? Alex, can you read that? Acts 19. Yep. All right, let's pause it there. He, he, he meets some, some people. Are these people Christians or non-Christians that Paul met in Ephesus? Christians. They're Christians, right? They're called what in this? They're called disciples, right? A disciple is a student, a disciplined one, somebody who is, who is taking Jesus seriously. This is somebody who's going to claim to be a Christian. Paul's first question to, to check out another Christian to see where they're at, what's his first question to them? 
did you receive the Spirit? That's his first question to them. And then what do they say? No. What's the Holy Spirit? Like, I don't even know what that is. And he said, go ahead, Alex. Prophesying. All right. So here we have all three different things. You have um, the baptism of John, right? So he assumes that they were baptized, but he doesn't think they're baptized into Christian baptism because if they had, they would have received the Spirit. So he's like, into what then were you baptized? They're like, well, it was, it was at John's baptism. Because John had a ministry that was active before the time of Christ. So you have to take into consideration some people, you know, joined John's movement and then jumped from John's movement to Jesus' movement. But they, they never actually declared Jesus to be Messiah or Lord or had experienced Christian baptism. And Paul's like, all right, look, first thing we need to do is get you guys squared away with Jesus. You need John. John's whole ministry was pointing to Jesus. OK, on hearing this, they're like, all right, let's do it. Let's get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they do that. And then Paul, Paul lays his hands on them. Um, the, and then they receive the Holy Spirit. And in this case, they speak in tongues and they prophesy. Obviously, that doesn't happen every time, but that's what happened this time. And uh, so the Spirit is a, an important part of conversion that sometimes gets left out for whatever reason. Um, but here's another important scripture on it. Romans 8, 8 through 11. Who wants to... Uh, Becca? All right. So there are two huge statements here made about the Spirit of God. The first of which is that you are not in the flesh, right up here, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells within you. Right? So if the Spirit of God dwells within you, you're not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit. All right? Who here wants to be in the flesh? I don't want to be in the flesh. I don't want to be tugged around by every temptation that might possibly come around. I'd rather be in the Spirit. I want to be uh, empowered by God to do the right things. And then this other statement down here, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. Who raised Jesus from the dead? God. God. So if the Spirit of God dwells in you, then He who raised Jesus from the dead. Who is He who raised Jesus from the dead? What? God. God. <laughs> you said it last time I said it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if, if you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, then God will give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit, which dwells in you. It should be which, not who. That's a translation issue. But the point is that having the Spirit inside of you is not just some sort of showy thing to, you know, that relates to Pentecostals or something. It's, it's an integral part of ultimate resurrection is that we want to we want to receive the spirit so that we are in the spirit not in flesh and that God will raise us from the dead now I'm gonna do a whole lecture on the Holy Spirit so I'm gonna come back to all this because um, this isn't really a lecture on the Holy Spirit it's a lecture on conversion but co conversion includes receiving the spirit uh, the spirit being poured out on people people being filled with the spirit or being baptized with the spirit did you have a question Okay, you were just adjusting there. Okay. The indwelling spirit means we belong to God and that he will resurrect us. 
And actually, that's our lec next lecture. Is the Holy is called the Holy Spirit, pneumatology. But for now, we have to call it quits for today. We have to take our quiz, and we have to go eat lunch. Okay. Woo. One more day, everybody. Oh, by the way, Dr. Joe wanted me to announce that Sloppy Joe's is available in the, uh, what do they call that room over there? The conference room? In the conference room. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>